This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. Like many kids growing up, Star Fox 64 was a landmark video game for me. The tight controls, exciting combat, and the iconic characters like Falco and Peppy were incredible. But once the PS2, Xbox, and GameCube came out, I decided to part ways with Nintendo in favor of the Xbox, meaning any follow-up to one of my favorite games would pass me by. All of my friends had one system or another, but outside of my Xbox, the console I preferred playing at my friend's house was the GameCube because it meant I got to play all the Nintendo games I wasn't getting on Microsoft's new console. But even then, my friend didn't have any Star Fox games on the GameCube, essentially telling me they didn't exist. Now we're pretty far removed from the GameCube's life, and I've started going back to all the games I missed, and Star Fox is one of those characters I'd like to catch up with. I didn't live under a rock. I grew up on the internet, I've known for years how every YouTuber views Star Fox Adventures. Their views are <clears throat> not positive, to say the least. But there was an entry in the series that has been totally overlooked, a game I didn't fully realize existed until the last couple of years or so, Star Fox Assault. Maybe it's the fact that the reputation of Adventures grew so large and bloated and hated that it lost Assault in its shadows, or maybe it's that they both start with an A, who's to say? Initially, this video was going to be solely dedicated to covering Star Fox Assault alone, not Adventures. Try to keep up with me here, I swear I keep getting these names mixed up, so I'll try to keep them straight as long as you promise you'll do the same. But little did I realize, despite the fact that these two games were made by two different studios, featuring entirely different forms of gameplay and totally different voice actors for every major role, these games share a story and continuity, and I just couldn't play a sequel knowing there was a story beforehand. So I've decided to take a trip in my time machine back to 2002, back to where the tenure of Star Fox on the GameCube began to give both games a fair shake from someone who has never played either. I really wanted to see for myself where these games went wrong, why they're more or less dropped in the trash can of video game history by the public, and more importantly, I wanted to see if these games are better than they're given credit for. So without further ado, here it is. Set phasers to forgettable, Star Fox's tenure on the GameCube. Let's not split hairs here. Almost every issue I have with Star Fox Adventures is likely attributed to the fact that this game originally started its life as an N64 game, wasn't supposed to be a Star Fox game in the first place, and was rushed to the finish line in order for Rare to complete its sale to Microsoft. And we'll get to why all those factors play against it, but to me, Star Fox Adventures walks the line between bad and good. There's nothing fundamentally broken or unfinished about it, something I was shocked to see. It gets a lot of hate online for being a disaster of a game likely played up for views and fake outrage. But while I agree the game isn't great, it was always going to fail the moment it became a Star Fox entry, let alone the follow-up to Star Fox 64, that ended a five-year drought for the series. While I'm not quick to judge spin-offs and actually encourage risk-taking when it comes to set-in-their-ways formulas, I think dropping a spin-off after years of silence is probably a bad move. Taking Fox out of his R-Wing was a huge shift for the series, and I can understand the disappointment from the fans. But this game reviewed really well. It's sitting at 82 on Metacritic. Like, what? My disappointment with the game stems more from the fact that if you squint, you can see what this game could have been. And if squinting isn't your thing, a playable build of Dinosaur Planet, the game that eventually morphed into Star Fox Adventures, was released on the internet. I haven't played it, from the screens I've seen you can get a pretty good idea about what the end goal was, but what was intended was not what we got. I will say though, in its presentation, Adventures is actually pretty nice looking. All of the different levels ooze that rare wear personality. The colorful and varied worlds really stand out, and the different regions of Dinosaur Planet feel distinct from one another. Each of these areas are also scored with original music that ranges from decent to memorable. At the very least, it's always appropriately backing what's happening on screen. You can still see a little bit of that rareware soul peeking out here, and it's really too bad that this is where my overwhelming compliments end. Now, I don't want to add to the played out meme pile that straight up dunks on this game. It wasn't supposed to be like this. You kind of just can't say no when Shigeru Miyamoto decides your game stars his character now, all the while rushing to finish the game too quickly. And to be frank, again, this game doesn't feel broken or unfinished. There's some jank in the cutscenes, but this game works. It functions fine. 
It's not riddled with glitches. It just needed more time and a better focus. There are times when this game is outright enjoyable. The boss fights in the game, while they might not be the most particularly interesting looking, they are at the very least different from one another, requiring you to crack the code on defeating them that goes past just wailing on them with your staff. Seeing the bosses that came next kept me going, and they seem like that's where a lot of the ideas went. But that also means that other parts of the game are much less fun and thought out. The story is an example of that. Star Fox Adventure starts us off playing as Crystal, a blue fox trying to figure out why her home planet shattered into a billion pieces. She runs into the sinister General Scales, a tyrant seeking to defeat the dinosaurs in their ongoing war. Crystal is persuaded by one of the dinosaurs to side with them to assemble the spirits of Krizoa Palace and help tilt the war back into their favor. Unfortunately, after defeating the simplest shell game of all time, unfortunate for me to have to play it, I mean, Crystal gets trapped in a crystal tomb after returning the first spirit. Whew. Good thing her name wasn't Raw Sewage Pipe or things might have gotten hairy. It's after this intro that Fox McCloud himself enters the picture, broke, bored, and missing Falco. A distress call comes across their communicator, and for the sake of money, Fox sets out to Dinosaur Planet to investigate. I mention money being the driving factor because Fox keeps bringing up how he isn't paid enough for this, just all the time throughout the game. Once he gets to the planet, the odd shoehorning of the Star Fox brand into this game starts to reveal itself. General Pepper forbids Fox from bringing his blaster along because according to him, Fox shoots first and asks questions later. So to recap really quickly, someone sent a message into space because they're in danger, and Fox is so quick to fire his gun at innocent bystanders that he's not allowed to have a blaster anymore. Got it. From a development angle, Fox leaving his gun behind was a way of forcing the players into using the staff, Crystal's trusty weapon she drops from the sky by accident early on in the intro. The staff becomes Fox's main tool throughout the game for both combat and puzzle solving. He can smack enemies very unsatisfyingly with only one set of animations, might I add, but the staff can also shoot projectiles in the form of ice or fire. These projectiles join an extensive list of other abilities that enable Fox to overcome obstacles. Adventures takes the action and puts it behind the exploration and solving puzzles in a way that I can imagine was pretty jarring for fans not expecting it. In fact, it's a poorly kept secret that Star Fox Adventures has more in common with Ocarina of Time than it does the Star Fox games before it. It's an adventure game through and through. Look at the title. It's very evident that Zelda was the jumping off point for the original idea. In more ways than one, Star Fox Adventures feels like playing a rougher 3D Zelda game, contextual button inputs, automatic jumping, and wallet limits and all. You also have a partner character, Tricky the Dinosaur Prince, to help you on your journey. There are instances where Adventures does do things better than the source they took from. Instead of stopping you and telling you to hey, listen, to something totally obvious, Tricky acts as a native guide to help you tackle obstacles the dinosaurs have evolved to handle. The game handles inventory and commands much better than Zelda 2. Instead of forcing you to pause to equip items, you can navigate the inventory and commands with the C-Stick. It works way better than it sounds, and trust me, I was skeptical. But it lets you keep your momentum moving forward while you're also perusing your items. In other instances though, the game sticks way too closely to its inspiration. A lot of the areas, while again, are very nice looking, resemble familiar staples in the Zelda series, and sometimes you'll feel like you're solving puzzles you've definitely seen before. You'll stand on a lot of switches, shoot a lot of random spots on the wall to make things happen, etc. It's not bad, it's just not particularly new or interesting, it's just more of the same. But where Star Fox Adventures really starts to get in its own way and truly becomes a disappointing game is the strange padding all around the game and its collectibles and backtracking and R-Wing missions. By the time Rare was selling to Microsoft, they'd gotten pretty heavy-handed with the items you can pick up and collect. Star Fox Adventures is no different. To fly our R-Wing to new areas, you need fuel cells. To get Tricky to follow your commands, he needs to eat first. You feed him these sentient mushrooms, and he can only eat up to 5 at a time, and you can only hold 15 in reserve. But here's the issue with so many of every collectible. Take, as an example, Tricky's mushrooms. They're an important part of progression. But as you travel the world, they're everywhere. They never feel like a commodity or a valuable use of time harvesting. More often than not, you'll find them right next to where you need to use them, and at that point, if they're always there, why make you collect them at all? If they're a given, what's the point? It's not a challenge, it's not adding anything, it's just busy work. It's a solution for a problem the game itself introduces, so just take it out. And that's just one example. 
In an adventure game where exploration is the entire purpose of the game, if the player doesn't have any reason to leave the beaten path to get every item they need, you've lost the plot. And to amend this issue and force you to take multiple looks at every area, there's no fast travel system. Thorntail Hollow acts as a hub world that connects you to places you visit more than once. The problem is, obstacles you face never go anywhere after you master them for the first time. I have to do this wind tunnel platforming segment again? I have to navigate this maze again? I think I'm only more frustrated with the fact that I have a literal spaceship that I could fly anywhere in an instant. Fox just chooses not to, and you know how I know that? In the final showdown, General Pepper literally says, I adjusted your coordinates to go straight to the roof of the palace. You couldn't have done that the entire time? This game does an awful job at justifying its limitations and decisions. When you go to the warp stone I lovingly referred to as Rock Shrek, <laughs> it does bother the mighty warp stone. he can warp Fox anywhere, no issue. So when you get to Krizoa Palace and Tricky is nowhere to be found, Rock Shrek goes, I can't warp dinosaurs. Okay, Tricky, let's find out where we can release the spirit. Tricky? Tricky! Ah, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell you, I cannot warp dinosaurs. Why? You can snap your fingers and teleport a random animal from outer space with no bones about it, but dinosaurs, the actual inhabitants who live there, all of a sudden you get cold feet? What is your purpose? Nobody ever brings me gifts anymore! Yeah, I wonder why. But back to the game and how it pads your experience while shoving in Star Fox stuff. Every time you need to travel to a different fragment of the planet that was blasted into orbit, you fly in your R-Wing. It should be cool. It's not. Every mission is a straight line and the goal isn't to shoot down space baddies, it's to collect gold rings to bring down the force field surrounding the broken piece of the planet. And even if you've traveled there before, you have to do the same mission again each time you go there. Once again, just to clarify, this game isn't broken. It's just boring. I was more than ready for this game to be over by the time I finished, especially because the entire plotline of General Scales is just tossed aside, quite literally, so you can go fight Andros because Star Fox, right? I am also extraordinarily uncomfortable with how many times I had to think about Fox McCloud being turned on. Well, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, sure, no problem. <laughs> You're not shy, are you, Fox? My sensors indicate Fox's temperature is rising. Drink some damn water, Fox. Cool it. With a lot of streamlining, Star Fox Adventures could have been a really good game. There isn't much more you can say about it. For a game with as turbulent of a development cycle as it had, I am impressed it functions this well at all. But that's really all I can give it praise for. It's too bad. Ultimately, I feel like Star Fox Adventures was much better than I expected, but it still didn't feel like much of an experience worth having. It just felt like a watered-down Zelda knockoff that tries its best to be as good and as effective as that series, but it doesn't really reach those heights. At the same time, it does have its enjoyable moments. They're just few and far between. But if you look at the average video online, you'd probably expect this to be the worst thing you've ever seen, and that's simply not true. It just kind of feels like not much. And to some people, a boring game is worse than a bad game. I'll let you be the judge of that. But either way, I had to play it before Star Fox Assault for the rich lore and the drama. Crystal joins the Star Fox crew, and we see Tricky all grown up. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. After finishing Star Fox Adventures, Assault feels like a return to normalcy. Despite the game sharing a storyline and that Assault is a direct sequel, these games are nothing alike. You'd never compare Pac-Man and Galaga, an appropriate metaphor considering Assault was developed by Namco this time around. Despite the fact these games are in the same story, every voice actor has been replaced, from Crystal, who somehow learned to speak fluent English since the last game, Careful, Fox. Ah, uh, you too, Crystal. To Tricky, who has now grown up and hit whatever the equivalent of puberty is for a Triceratops. Fox! Tricky! Fox! 
Crystal, I knew you'd come. Thank you so much. Tricky. So heavy. Ouch. It's sad to see Adventures of Stolen the Spotlight for all the wrong reasons, because Assault is a much better Star Fox game, and overall it's more enjoyable of an experience. It does have its issues, but I see this game as a much more worthy successor to Star Fox 64 as it's more in line with that style of game. I had a really good time with it, I really did. It takes some pretty hard swings. Some paid off, and some didn't. I liken Star Fox Assault to a band's greatest hits collection. It has all of the chart-topping songs, but it leaves a lot out of the deeper cuts that made the fans really fall in love past the radio airtime. And here's what I mean by that. From the time the game starts and you hop in Fox's R-Wing, it feels like a class reunion. It's so good to see Falco as part of the team again, after he only appeared for two seconds in Adventures. And wow, cool, Fox brought his new girlfriend along. Let's all fly through space and dunk on Pigma just like the good old days. It feels familiar, but it's fresh at the same time. Andros isn't the main supervillain this time around, and instead you're fighting the Aperoids, an Instagram-friendly drink that sips like a Capri Sun after soccer practice on a hot day and not in a good way. <sighs> I thought I was reading the Star Fox wiki, this is just an opinion piece on the Aperol Spritz. The Aperoids are this bio-cyborg that absorb all living things and infect them to create terror weapons like Mecha Pigma. The story is kinda dumb, but who cares? Playing Star Fox for the story is like saying you read Playboy for the women. What are you, unevolved? Of course I'm gonna read a 24,000 word interview with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Yes, that's real. The story really only acts as a way to get you into different planets and to fight in space. In Star Fox Assault there are 10 levels to play with two real forms of gameplay. On one hand you have the bread and butter R-Wing sections that feel great. They are so much freaking fun. Flying through space, doing barrel rolls, evading enemies, combining a unique bittersweet taste and bright orange color that derived from a secret original recipe. Damn it! The other half of the gameplay is more experimental and unique to this game. It puts Fox on the ground and forces him to blast his way through waves and waves of enemies to blast aperoid nests and eradicate them before they take over the galaxy. The on-foot controls are okay, they're just a bit weird. By default, you have to stand still if you want to aim because the right stick is used to cycle weapons instead of looking around. Your reticle is pretty large and forgiving though, so it's not the worst. But with enemies considerably far above your head, expect to take some hits. Most of the time, your on-foot campaign will be aided by pilotable vehicles like the Landmaster that just annihilates anything in your way. You'll also have access to the R-Wing in many missions, and when you jump in one of those, you essentially go into all-range mode and have 360-degree control over your ship, just like in 64's dogfighting segments. You'll still be forced to partake in objectives on foot, but I found the variety interesting because you aren't doing anything for too long. My biggest complaint is the lack of checkpoints as you make progress. So on this level I had to destroy a bunch of nests, but I would get halfway done and die and have to start over entirely. So yeah, remember that greatest hits thing? Lots of great stuff is back, but it's lacking in the key ingredient that made Star Fox 64 beloved. Replayability. The 10 missions in Star Fox Assault are pretty good, but that's all there is. Star Fox 64 had branching paths that encourage you to explore and experiment to open new paths. To me, that's the missing sauce from Assault. You aren't encouraged to immediately restart the game when it's over. Instead, you unlock stuff for multiplayer like ships and levels. But don't let that turn you off from giving this game a shot. I'm surprised it isn't more fondly remembered. I had a ton of fun with it, and the gameplay will certainly fit longtime fans like a glove. You're just gonna have to get used to those on foot controls. I promise, it's worth it though. Assault is also much shorter than Adventure, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Assault doesn't overstay its welcome, rather giving you a few fun hours to beat in one sitting. In some ways, Star Fox Assault feels like if you finished a book you loved and then realized that there were more chapters you didn't know about, and I think that says a lot for a game people forget entirely, or at least I know I did. So those were the Star Fox games for the GameCube. After playing both of them, I don't think they deserve the reputation they get, one game being ripped to shreds by the internet jury, and the other almost forgotten to time. In a way, I feel like had these games released in opposite order, Assault first and then Adventures, the conversation around them might be different. Instead of giving Ravenous fans a spin-off, you might have been able to quell them with a more traditional game and then send the spin-off their way as gravy. But that's just wishful thinking and doesn't take the continuity of the story into account. Going back to look at these games was an interesting experience to say the least. I find something so interesting about glossed over entries in popular series, and I was really excited to go and play through these for myself. I'm glad I did. Overall, I'd say you should give them a chance if you haven't. 
This was such a weird vertical slice of Star Fox history that kind of stands on its own in the series. They're both so different that, despite sharing characters, the gameplay in both games aren't anywhere near each other. I find something so fascinating about that. One of these games is going to hit with you. I've even seen some defense of Star Fox Adventures more recently from people I actually follow and respect, so you never know. It might just be for you. If you'd like to chat about some Star Fox, hit me up in the comments down below. I'd love to talk about the series. What did you think about these games if you played them? Thank you so much for watching this far into the video. I really appreciate it. If you liked it, please consider leaving a like on it. If you want to see more videos by me, you can hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon to make sure you never miss an upload. If you want to support the channel directly, you can head to the Patreon link in the description below and check out my tiers starting at $1. You get some exclusive videos you can't get anywhere else. Lastly, I'd like to thank my higher tier patrons, Andrew Elmore, Andrew Lang, Sebastian Pereira, and 8BitJesus. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.